Welcome Spartans to the podcast of all January Book Club in February. I'm your host Aaron and with me this week is David. Hey Aaron. And we are going over the long-awaited and rumoured Last Light Book Club. And promised. There was also promises made. But we are we are actually getting around to it now which makes a change. Exactly. Ta-da! Yeah, Book club. we're up to date. Right, so... I say, if you haven't followed us, we're I say we're going over Last Light. It's the last full novel to come out. What Krista would call a real book. Yes, a real book, not one of those fake digital books. In fact, it's a real book that was printed by Simon and Schuster, and the author is Troy Denning. Who I have to say, after reading this, I'd give him a thumbs up. Oh, I'd be a fan after reading this. Yeah, I, I liked his work. Uh, he's got a lot of good stuff in it, and this book was released on the fifteenth of the ninth of last year just just a little while ago and it's out as a print and digital book i think i have both copies at the minute me too it's it's not a bad book but quite long about 400 pages give or take yeah it'd be about average for a halo book i'd say about sort of contact harvest parole code cold protocol sort of a yeah, well, i'm looking at it right now and it kind of compares with like some of the primordium and cryptum they'd be around the same size i mean i think the largest was probably morta de tata i think her first strike i'd have thought are the forerunner trilogy books not bigger maybe my ones are just like they're longer books but like i'm purely basing it off looking at it from the side they look thicker oh no, I, I can't tell because for some reason Amazon, when I ordered my copy of Mortal Dictata, sent me a large print version. Ooh. I couldn't work out why my paperback novel was the size of my iPad. <laughs> and then it's for it those lovely big it's, words. Aaron. It's just the one on the shelf and it just sits there and it's bigger than everything else. And it's annoyed me, but I've never gone to replace it. But uh, okay, well, that's enough about my sad novels. <laughs> Uh, I suppose we, we'll do a quick rundown. Uh, normally, if you listen to our book clubs, you'll know we sort of talk through the plot and the synopsis and we go through it. But it's been a while since we've done a full novel and there's just no way we can do that and keep the show less than about four hours. And in some way interesting. Yeah, so we'll do a quick sort of overview of it and talk about the bits we liked and the bits we didn't and then maybe get some of yourselves to give us some feedback in the group and see what you thought of it. Let's see. The book, it takes place... In the Halo timeline, it's July 2553, and it's a little interesting piece of trivia. It's three months after the events of Mortal Dictata. Okay, so where did this come from? Ah, see, this uh, we'll get into it, but uh, cool. the events in this book are set up by a particular incident in Mortal Dictata that they go into and reveal about halfway through the book. It just happened to... Uh, it only happened to lodge in my memory because I was listening to the audiobooks at the time for the Kalo 5 trilogy. Only for that, I probably wouldn't have put two and two together. No, oh, very good. I, I haven't. I'm dying to hear you spoil this thing for me. Well, let's see. The, the quick version of the book is... There's the 717th xeno materials exploration battalion that's a mouthful yep themselves along with blue team head to another colony world of uh gal gal I, I like i like gal in the cordoba system where they've received a signal from a forerunner installation so they go there to figure out what this installation is what the signal is and they have their suspicions that there's a forerunner ai there so they go to this uh, expansive cave system and they go down there in search of it but it's a it's a basically would the would the right word be it's a seceded colony they're independently run they're not yeah they're not unsc think, run anymore they were a insurrectionist were, yeah, colony that went they yeah. went independent yeah pretty much so there's they no love themselves. lost between the the unsc and the locals so it's it's all very tense and the, the unsc are there yeah there's major tension between the two kind of parties yeah, the the president of the colony, uh, President Arlo, has let the UNSC on because he knows he can't really say no. Or President Aponte, sorry, not Aponte. President Arlo. Mm-hmm. I'm getting confused. He's let them on. I think at one point he does say in the book, you know, like we, we can't stand up to a UNSC battalion. We either play nice or we get splattered. And that's the He's sort the of, only kind of realist there. Like Everyone else doesn't seem to really get that. Yeah, everyone else is a bit sort of blindly patriotic of we'll stand up to the UNSC scum. And yeah, yeah. You're kind of thinking, no, you, you won't. You'll be steamrolled. Pretty much. Yeah. So they go there anyway, but during the course of events, uh, some locals are murdered in the caves. And this is around the same time that the uh, blue team have gone in. So 
a local task force is sent in to investigate them. Oh, what's the acronym for them again? The GMOP, isn't it? Yeah, I'm sure they had like a... Oh, yeah. The GAO. G- yeah, I think it's like GMOP. It's a GMOP or something like that. Yeah. They go in under the leadership of uh, Veda Lopez. She leads the investigation team in to try and figure out who exactly killed them. And when they get down there, they've discovered, you know, the people that were murdered appear to have been torn apart and dismembered. Yeah, and that's pretty much where the book starts and it kicks off as a kind of murder mystery. But then quickly devolves into all this normal halo tropes of... Explosions and war and combat and... Yeah, that too. Backstabbing. I, I do like that sort of... Uh, the, in the first half of the book when they are investigating and they're trying to figure out what happened and place the bodies. But uh, when they do investigate it, they figure out that the only, you know... Either someone that's incredibly strong or with an exoskeleton. I.e. a Spartan. Yes, would be the only people capable of tearing the victims apart. So, of course, uh, suspicion drifts towards, I think, initially it's Fred, but then Veda sort of turns her eye towards the uh, Gamma Company Spartans because she slowly figures out that they have been tampered with. Yeah, but she didn't know they existed. She only knew of the three Spartans. And then eventually she kind of pulls out of Fred that there's more Spartans assigned to... um that battalion and then we have i think the some of beta and gamma team so spartan trees yeah it's fred uh tom and lucy i think in the beginning isn't it well it's just it's just fred oh, and no, linda wait. that's and right Kelly it is. it's fred and them. linda yeah tom and lucy are on the surface so uh long version short the locals whilst all this is happening get uh, very pissed off and the minister of protection uh arlo cassell teams up with some brute uh religious extremists and some insurrectionists to transport brutes and jackals down into the cave system to attack the UNSC and see can they acquire the Ancilla or the Oracle as the brutes call it. They've picked up the signal as well and they've come looking for their Oracle. Yeah they've they've come looking the same thing as the UNSC and the only people that don't seem to know that there's an AI in the facility are the The, Gao locals. locals, They don't have a clue so Uh, A war kicks off underground and Blue Team are trapped. And that, well, Fred and the Gamma Spartans are trapped. And the Gamma Spartans quickly run out of their soothers. And that's when suspicion drifts towards them as being the uh, psychologically unhinged Spartans. Which they kind of are. Yeah. And specifically, suspicion falls towards mark he's there's mark vet. olivia and ash yeah he's he's actually kind of awesome in this, in this book he, he is very awesome but he's very detached from everything i think it is like the way he sort of comes across you know yeah they made that sound that that was kind of deliberate that he was detaching himself as a measure of control and to help himself kind of focus on himself and just detaching from others yeah like his whole you know he's going around stabbing brutes to death like it says a lot about him you know he didn't shoot them he didn't do anything else he went right up and personal and stabs them in the back of the neck yeah i was going to bring that up later on we're talking about some of the best bits like there's a great scene in there. there there are quite a few actually the war kicks off there's there's a lot of stuff that's i don't we can't really go through the whole synopsis yeah, like that's to, about the first third of the book yeah but i think it's important to mention that like in all the parties that have mixed up in all the combat between the locals the insurrectionists that are there the couple of brutes and jackals that are there and no the unsc there's like the ancilla is called intrepid eye but he has an actual her uh, paragraph with him that's the whole thing is intrepid eyes there she this is where it links back to mortal dictata she was in stasis um it turns out that the entire cave system is a disguised forerunner installation and it was like a medical and resupply station the point being that if any enemies discovered it it would look like a natural formation but in a time of crisis you know warrior servants could come there refuel kit up and head back out into the fight but she is reactivated when she receives a distress signal from a nearby installation which is destroyed this installation being a forerunner installation on a nearby planet and the name which escapes me right now shack three shack three yeah which if you remember in mortal dictata is the planet that the jackals test out the ventral beam of pious inquisitor oh i did not know that when uh, with uh, Naomi's dad, you know when they do the test yeah. firing and the yeah. engineer cracks up and they they vaporize the forerunner structures. Okay, yeah, that, I remember that. that that's happened. the facility. I never connected these two together. That's cool. That sends the distress signal to this installation, 
and then that's when Intrepid Eye activates. Um, they reveal that uh, Rome's alone, the Uragog, has been active the entire time. He's just spent his time looking after like the bats and different little creatures that live in the cave. I like that. This is the first time we see a Uragog that isn't like an engineer. He's like yeah, because they they've hinted at them before. Yeah, they they this is like a different species essentially or a subspecies that heals and mends people. And wounds as opposed to like uh, vehicles yeah, and machines. machines and technology. So that's pretty cool. I like that a lot. Yeah, and that's the sort of say, you know, these are the first time he's seen humans. They've never come this far into the cave up until then. He was just scurrying about looking after the bats. Yeah, well, I think they were saying that like um, he was the one doing the healing of the people and then he was erasing their memories of him of him being there i think if i remember he was trapped in the lower section of the base with bats and different creatures the cave creatures that lived down there and then there was an explosion and it brought down part of the cave system and when that happened he was able to get free oh yeah and then he up. started yeah he started yeah. to float around the higher bits and he started to heal people and wipe their memories so as far as people were concerned the caves were starting to heal them and more and more were coming yeah so then became like a tourist attraction to come and get yep. healed and sit in the bath and all that kind of crack and then eventually Intrepid Eye started to murder them. Murder. Yes. And the reason she's driven to murder is she tries to contact the forerunner Ecumen to get orders and find out what's happening because she was told she wouldn't be re- she would only be reactivated when she was summoned by the Ecumen. Um so she can't get in contact with anyone. Although they do hint at she sends a signal off and she, they do say that she receives a weak reply, but she can't decipher it. And she's not sure if it's a reflection of her own signal or just a weak signal from the forerunners. Oh, right. Which I thought was an interesting little touch to put in there. That was it a weak signal from someone that's left alive in the galaxy? Guilty spark. Probably. Who knows? I wanted to be the other didact. But yeah. So anyway, these all these guys are fighting each other over this little town, over the at the cage cave entrance. Intrepid eyes basically playing everyone off each other, yeah, so that she can get a hold of some better communications equipment. So she essentially like um, so like there's an AI named Wendell. He was part assigned to the battalion, and she pretty much like takes over this AI. Yeah, she kills a marine that has a chip, a section of Wendell in her in his compad. She hacks that chip, and then during the course of the story, Fred gets a hold of the chip and puts it in his armor. So she then hacks Fred's armor, mm. and she uses Fred's armor to disrupt the, the signals. On, and, yeah, 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 she monitors everyone, and then at one point she scrambles the signals on the planet. And then in the one bit of the story that I did not like, she uses she attempts to take control of Fred's armor and use him, use him without his own consent. But he's in the armor at the time, isn't he? If I remember correctly, he he is in the armor. He's wearing it. But they talk about how she she takes control of his right arm and starts to draw his pistol just before one of the other Spartans shoot out the power pack on the back of his armor and render him useless. No, that was Veta had planted a bomb in his power. Oh, that's pack. right. Yes, she had the schematics and took it out and took him out. Took out his power suit with it. This was her kind of like trump card if a Spartan was to turn on her and stuff. If the Sparta was the serial killer. And that she that would is be right. able to disable his armor like that. I do not like that an AI was able to... Because I know they've hinted at in the Forerunner trilogies. Actually, they just come out and say it. That at one point when Mendigant Bias takes over the Forerunners, he locks everyone's armor up and can take control of them and can move the armor, you know. The armor can move itself and manipulate the person inside. Well, that's all based on how, that's how the for, is like the armor and circuitry and the AI actually connected. Yeah, but in the thing I've always thought with Mjolnir was it's not actually it's not a mechanical suit like an exoskeleton. It's a liquid crystal suit powered by the reactor that that's magnifies. That's only one part of it though. There's a lot to the Mjolnir suit. Like it totally is an exoskeleton. It is in the sense that it's over the top of the body but it's a gel suit. If I'm remembering back to my Fall of Reach days properly someone can correct me on this if I'm wrong. It's a gel suit. That's only a part of it. Like this is the gel, the, the gel suit is like not the armor at all. It's like a suit that they put on under the armor. Well yeah the gel suit is the underlayer but the gel suit's what essentially powers the movement the the gel when powered through the reactor core magnifies the spartan's 
strength and speed by whatever it is a factor of five so there's no actual mechanical parts it's not like an exoskeleton in the way that a mantis is the armor linking suit would be an exoskeleton i would imagine that they have mechanical parts to that isn't well. it just plate on top of the gel layer i didn't think so that that was though well that was always the impression i had because like when you know when they strip chief off in halo 4 they're just steel plates bolted around the undersuit you know, when they bolt up a uh, crimson team, you know, when they put their armor on, they're just plates bolted on over the top of... The chest piece bolts on front and back, but the chest piece isn't attached to the forearm and shoulder pads. I don't know. Anyway, and this apparently Intrepid Eye can take control of a Spartan and move his arm involuntarily. Well, barely. Well, yeah, well, they do take him out before she she manages to do anything with it, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that one, but it was something just that stood out to me. It's, uh, it's this book's Nanobots. Nanobots. To uh, beat an old drum again. That was great. I like the Nanobots. I'm okay with them. No, I don't like it. I do like Nanobots. Nanobots are a great get-out-of-jail-free card. No. So, uh, let's... What do we have after this? There's a massive firefight. There's a war on the surface. So they manage Intre- to capture Intrepid Eye with like a scrambling device. And then they, they kind do. of... They get the the Hurgok and the Intrepid Eye. And they kind of try to extract this as blue team with the... With Veda Intel. Try to... um Intel even. Try to extract from the cave system. And they pretty much find themselves in the middle of the war zone. Yeah. So then it's like a kind of free for all kind of battle going on around this little town. It's at like uh, the cave entrance or one of them. It's the what do they call it? The is this that's the vitality center, isn't it? It's like a spa. Yeah, that's what outside the caves. It's like a hotel or something, a hotel complex that the UNSC have taken over, and the whole village is slowly being leveled by the brutes. Well, there's kind of just two fronts of I remember there was where their HQ was, which was the spa. But there was also a small town separated because didn't there was a whole section of that's right that's blue team come up yes yeah they're trying to reinforce that town and like their war hogs get stuck because they blow up the roads if I remember there's loads like, yeah they're, they're trying to go through on. the jungle and the yeah. falcons are shot out of the air along with the pelicans so surprise surprise this book has several crashed pelicans being blown up it has quite a few and it has falcons which we haven't seen in a while. That's true. I like them. I know most some people don't, but I did like falcons. No, I quite like the I quite like the falcons. Them. Yeah, no, I like I like the choppers. It's something different, you know. Yeah, gotta get to the choppers. <laughs> so there's one failed attempt to evac the Spartans back to the command center. That goes horribly wrong, and during that process, uh, Fred almost bites the dust. Mm-hmm. At one point, he's unconscious and his armor's locked, and Veda rides him down a hill like a toboggan. That was pretty cool. I thought it was funny. Especially because they made a joke about it later on in the book. I thought that was very clever. Yeah, they reference it again. And then on their second evac, they successfully make it back to the command center. And then it becomes under attack, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And a lot of people bite the dust in this story. Yeah, that's another thing to notice. That this story is like many other halo books where there's a lot of dead there's a lot of characters to this book and there's a lot of dead people yeah they're, they're, like there's we have maybe 15 16 characters listed here just for quick reference for the names but that's maybe only half of the people total there are a lot of people that get taken out even many on this list get taken out I like there are quite a few you know Quite a few people get name dropped only for the purposes of getting killed later on in the story. Yeah. So I suppose, what did you think of it? Well, yeah, I guess just um, how the kind of story ends then is. Oh yes. They manage Ending to be back. Good. They, they have like the intrepid eye kind of uh, rejects humanity as having the mantle, seeing as too violent because it. Oh, comes actually, out and sees here, yeah. War. While you remind me of this, there's a whole plot going on as intrepid eye interrogates Wendell. Yeah. That's like that happens every now and again where like Wendell thinks he's hacking the Encella, but the Encella is like so much more advanced yeah, than it's, Wendell. You know, and this this goes on and on for a while until eventually Intrepid Eye murders him. Yeah, pretty much wipes out Wendell. And just sort of him deletes over. him and takes over him. So that's where like the Encella is like jumping from like bodies to bodies, essentially trying to escape and the humans are trying to capture and pin it down. And eventually yep. she has to kind of murder Wendell and take over his data chip. Data yeah, centers. and when she's in his data chip, that's the moment the Spartans pounce and capture her. Yeah, but I think I, I think they don't know that at the time. Did I think they eventually figure it out that that's where she went. Yeah, they, they figure out... So they trap her in during the case of this, uh, yeah, Veda is injured, but she just um, 
Feta gets attacked in an airlock by Intrepid Eye, and he try or he or she tries to suffocate her mm-hmm. um, in the airlock. And then whilst Feta's just sort of on the brink of passing out, she says Wendell to Fred, and that's enough. Fred doesn't quite know what's going on, but he goes and they get Wendell's data chip, and it's only later that they find out Wendell's no longer on the chip, and it's mm. Intrepid Eye, which is basically this entire operation, and all the hundreds of UNSC soldiers that are dying were just for the purposes of catching this forerunner AI. Pretty much. Because as they mentioned, they don't have, uh, they've never had a forerunner AI to, you know, talk to and interrogate or speak to the closest they came to is guilty spark yeah for a little while and but then they had um that they then convinced intrepid eye to work with them so he kind of agreed begrudgingly saying that like oh he'll use his chance to escape or whatever eventually so he like begrudgingly agrees to like yeah intrepid eye basically decides that humanity are the reclaimers but they need a little uh they need help help and manipulation along the way and that uh with a few thousand years of experimenting, you know, reckons they can that this he, he can, can tweak can them guide it. Yeah, yeah, can guide humanity. So eventually, they like they get out and they like they 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 nuke the. Yes, the there's a nice the little uh, appearance from Sarah Osman. I like them that up at, at the, the last minute in yeah. the Pelican. I like. Or it was like um no, it was some kind of stealth thing, prowler thing, wasn't it? it was some oh, kind it's of, the they called it something. They're not pelicans. They're owls. Owls. Yeah, there we go. I want to see you know the same, it, the way they describe them. I think in the Kilo Five books is they're like a fatter, chunkier version of a pelican. You know, they're stealth plated, and I think they have more in the way of like comms tech and stuff on them. But probably less weapons, less offensive. Yes, they're they're less they're less well armored. They're designed for sneaking about. Yeah. So yeah, pretty much. Then like Osmond swoops in, evacs the blue team along with the other Spartan threes, and then um, offers Veda a job. She explains to Veda that there's a position open for a job I can't really tell you about, but the short version would be it might be babysitting the Gamma Spartans because we can't have them in the field anymore. Not yeah. not in a combat role where they might end up... Off their meds. Yeah, because yeah, they they need a lot of meds to stop them going schizophrenic. So I, I like the idea of like where that's going with the story. Like I want to see what happens next with them. Yeah, well, what is it she calls them? Ferrets. Like a, like a ferret team, yeah. Yeah, they investigate whatever they need to investigate and then within the unsc and mm-hmm. she would be in charge and there would be her little minions to go and essentially figure out things out root out problems kill people rescue people they're essentially like a i imagine that they would operate a lot like gray team where they're just kind of sent out to on yeah, their like own kind of gray team or like another kilo five sort of a team yeah kilo, yeah sorry that's a good way yeah another kind of kilo five that's essentially the story so you ask me then what do i think of it i really really like this book I thought it was very, very good. I was highly impressed with um, the story, the characters. I mean, really out of this book, I came out like absolutely loving Fred. Like I knew very little about him. The majority of the book is it's Fred. Yeah. It's all about Fred. That's kind of, there's two main characters, but like Fred absolutely outshines everyone else in this book. So you've got Veda Lopez, Lopez, Lopez and Fred. And there's a lot of kind of great banter between the two. I think she's a great character, Veda. I like her a lot. I like the idea we haven't had a kind of detective in the Halo universe before. So she's a very different kind of character than we're used to. She's not like a soldier or a spy or an alien. Do you know, she's a Yeah, detective. she's, you know, like the sort of a badass version of a cop. She's nearly like... And the other thing I like about it is the way the justice system works there. Is oh, she's yeah, kind yeah. of like Judge Dredd. Pretty much, yeah. I like that. She yeah, finds the evidence, she passes judgment, and she takes people out on the spot. Yeah, she like oh she she makes loads of comments about like how oh I don't go to trial none of my cases go to trial kind of thing like yeah um, once I have enough evidence to prove that it's concrete I'll sort you out you know there and then yeah they're giving great kind of very free reign so she's kind of like this kind of gunslinger Judge Dredd is a great I suppose uh, analogy for what what she's like um which is a very cool character and giving that character a team of Spartan trees and only backing like. That's interesting. That's interesting yeah. as fuck. I want to see where that goes. It's almost, you might say, interesting enough to be a TV show. <gasps> that would be a great TV show, actually. I remember, was it Drew that wanted a cop show? He might something have said that something wasn't a soldier lines. show. He said a bunch of things about like something in the hell of universe that wasn't a soldier. When I was finishing reading this, I was kind of thinking, you have a cop, you have investigations. It's not the military. 
and you have Spartans that you don't need to have in Mjolnir every week because the Spartan 3 is just uh, SPI armor. Yeah, no one lets the Gammas play with that stuff. I think at one point Mark says that. He's like, no one's going to let us in the suit of Mjolnir just know it's not going to happen. Yeah, they're too unstable. I, I think Fred references that at one point. He's like, you know, if I have to take them down, you know, I'm in my armor, I can sort that out. Yeah. But otherwise you'd be in trouble. It's it. I, I did enjoy this book a lot. I came away from it definitely i could go for another book i could follow on with yeah veda and the gamma company spartans and see what they do next and you really do get a strong feeling for fred like i've never there's very few of the spartan twos you have a really good sense of who they are you know there's like chief, even, yeah well even chief it, t- it took years for people like and to get uh, get to know chief really and you got to read the books if you want to know chief because you're not going to find that in the games yeah and i said like there's them there's gray team you would you'd have a good sort of feeling for but they were only ever in one book but they were awesome do you know what i mean but that's it but there's very few like you think of all the spartan twos and there's very few of them you get that deep a feel for like even in this book kelly and linda that's the one thing like well one of the things i didn't really like about this book there was fuck all of kelly and linda in this book you come away from it and you don't feel like you know them any better as characters you know no not at all but I suppose I see where they were kind of coming from. How far out can you spread it? With a, bu- with a book like this with so many characters, it's hard to give every character their due. But I would have thought the blue team deserved it a little bit better. I mean, yeah. this is the first time that we've seen... What I did like about it is how blue team is integrated with the gammas and betas. And that's, that comes straight out of um, Ghost of Onyx. Yeah, they are... Well, they are the last of the Spartans, aren't they? Minus the fours. Minus the fours. This, of the Spartan threes, I don't. I think there is a mention. June has a throwaway comment somewhere. Uh, I think in one of the books that there is Spartan threes, and even at the end of this, Osmond does mention there are other gammas. There's other gammas, so I imagine that th- there's other ferret teams out there. That would be. I'm wondering, is that the leftovers? Do you remember in Ghosts of Onyx there were the gamma Spartans uh, in stasis? I but yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it was them because all the other gammas I thought had shipped off world. They either killed them all in Ghost of Onyx or they were in stasis as far as I remember. And they had yeah. they had obviously Tom and Lucy plus Olivia, Mark and Ash, is it? Ash is the other character. I think they were all in Yeah, Onyx. Ash, Olivia, Mark. That's the yeah. the rest of the team. And I like the way the uh, Fred and Linda that seem sort of almost sort of parentally protective yeah of the i was Spartans. just about to say that there's a great dynamic in that team i would have liked to have seen more of that do you know what i mean like they obviously got split up at the end of this book but i would love to have seen what happened in between onyx where they were just strangers to this book where they're obviously a well-knit well-coordinated team where the spartan twos are essentially raising the spartan threes and they're like helping yeah, them get in control like, and all that kind you of kind of get that hint that and they sort of go into it in glasslands as well when they're dealing with them and that you know that the spartan twos can kind of see the you know they can see that they're they are spartans you know yeah they're, I never they're not th- they're not really built the same way like they don't sort of they don't look down on them in the way that halsey does in those books no you know? yeah halsey is the major kind of like they're she not has a friends. real low opinion of them yeah and you can even get that in reach which how she dealt with like um noble team yeah like i don't know how spartan twos feel about spartan fours you know i'd, I'd love to see that but the threes have gone through the same sort of things the same sort of training you know yeah i think other than george i don't think we've ever seen any real interaction between spartan fours and twos like other than like chief doesn't seem to give two shorts at all george spartan two noble noble spartan yeah. fours the other who, who no noble were spartan threes no they're fours all the threes were kids noble was four no no, no. pretty sure noble was four sure. noble noble existed before the spartan four program came into the lore no, this is part of what bungie fact up in the timeline you sure because i was pretty sure and they were they were noble fours I thought that you're making me doubt myself. Now. I'm, hang on, I'll I'll, uh, I'll insert some Google music here for a second. Spartan threes. I, I was almost sure because they're the only Spartan threes I've ever seen with uh, with actual Mjolnir armor, not SPA. But that's it's part of the problem is they shouldn't be as old as they are. Doesn't make any sense to my brain. Yeah, 
they're uh, like even Tom and Lucy at this stage are no. Well, wait, Tom and Lucy are they're betas, so maybe nobles are like a. You know, if no, well, the Alpha were... Company were wiped out completely, so the first beta were the first, and Tom and Lucy were the only ones to survive. So in theory, Noble Team would have to be at least Charlie Company. Okay. So I don't know when you'd have to figure out a check when Charlie Company went into production because they've never specifically mentioned them. Okay. But it's part of the things aren't quite right with Reach. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Hang on, through the power of Google. Googly. Beta Company engaged in Operation Prometheus in 2537. So 2537 to 2553 would make... Well, they were conscripted in 2539, 2540. They'd be in their mid-20s okay. by the time this would take place. But that would still mean that uh, Noble Team... No, it's only a few years before that. So Noble Team, maybe, except for the fact that Tom and Lucy are the only betas to survive. It's It's a mess. That's crazy, yeah, okay. It's it's one of those things that just doesn't quite... That's the problem with the, the, the little threads that don't sort of work and reach when you start to pull at them, it unravels. I don't know, I, I can tune out the issues when I don't look at them. Okay, so other than that then, I don't know of any real interactions between fours and twos. Yeah, no, I, I would like to see that. I'd like to know what they think of each other because I know like the, the fours revere the twos we know that oh yeah sure everybody does i mean the, the twos are the definition the the standard of what is to be a spartan so I'd, I'd like to know do the twos you know do the twos look down on the fours because they are you know i don't think the twos look down on anybody i never got that impression often that they're even they're, i mean they're not they were bred like that do you know what i mean they don't even look down on humans do you know what i mean on regular humans mm, true good point they don't have a god complex no, not at all. I mean, all of the kind of negative connotations of Spartan 2s is just humanity's outlook on them, their fear, and like how soldiers treat the Spartans when they don't know them. They treat them, you know, they think them as freaks, as like, you know, robots and all that kind of stuff. And but all of that just comes back on them. And you all, you see there's loads of stories, Halo Universe, there's literally with stories of just, you know, like human soldiers and stuff like going, oh, Spartans, boo, we don't like them, they're monsters or whatever. Something happens, Spartan 2 save the day and... They have they actually interact with us with the Spartans. They see them for what they are, and they totally they change their tune. They change their tune straight away. The the thing I always remember is that scene in Halo Three when Chief's walking through oh yeah the crow's nest, and the Marines are sitting on the crates, and they're like, "Look, it's a Spartan." And the the blind Marines like, "You better not be fucking with me," you know. Yeah. It's like, "No, no, no. They're they're real. We're safe," you know. Yeah, but they're so rare. You know, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's a big deal to see one uh, for a regular Joe soldier. Yeah, right. So I suppose we'll wrap this up with what was your favorite bit? If you had to pick one. There's a lot of great moments. Um, there. I will say one thing. There is. Um, they have. They. I think what I. One thing I didn't really like. Or I thought was really, really weird. Like you know, they have the Spartan language that they use, with hand signals to coordinate yes. their feelings and their emotions. And I'm pretty sure Fred explains this to Veda. And I was like, that is so weird that he's including an outsider on this really intimate thing. Well, this is kind of the thing. The whole way through the story, it builds on the fact like the, the Gamma Company Spartans start to refer to Veda as mom. Oh, yeah. Well, she's of, like a motherly figure to them. Yeah, yeah she, she has that sort of weird worry over them. And they, they find it quite amusing that she's concerned for them. So they start to call her mom the whole way through it. And it just sort of Remarking. sticks. But, yeah, you know, yeah. And Fred, like once she sort of proves her combat chops, you know, Fred sort of respects her as a person. And I almost get the feeling there's a little bit of a... There's a slight little potential romance. There's a bit of an attraction yeah, between the yeah. two of them. I thought so you, too. You picked up on that too. And he, well, yeah, well, he was the first... Well, I don't know about other Spartans, too, but he seemed the only one to really be self-aware enough of, like, a sexual attraction in terms of, like, a Spartan 2 being aware of a sexual attraction. Or at least the differences that that can create between genders or sexes, because obviously said when when she uses um Fred as like a sled to go down the thing, what was he? The great comment is like he was actually conscious. Yeah, he's he's locked up in the suit at the time. So we can't move or talk to anybody because um his power core has been like blown up or whatever, or like disabled. I can't remember the comment. He says like we'll have to do it again, or something like that about like or this time. I can't remember what it was. Yeah, the, there's the f- like the faintest hint of innuendo from him. Yeah, which that's you don't what I was get thinking. out of anyone else. Yeah, you know? totally. And I think there's a, a it says something about like Veda being mortified. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh my god, you were conscious. 
Um, yeah. I just thought that was, yeah, it was very funny. It was very good. Uh, yeah. So what were you saying? Oh, the best part. Obviously, I love how the Spartan trees are portrayed in this. I mean, how unstable they are, how dangerous, uh, like on the edge. There's great tension in within the unit, even break it down individually. Like um, Olivia goes through crazy trauma where she like, like has her legs crushed and um but still manages to get up walk and like take out a brute and or a sentinel is it i think she dives on top of a sentinel yeah she takes it out before it can cause any more damage oh uh, yeah that was and, and that's that was with awesome. two mangled legs that, yeah you know. that, was, that was incredible and then there's also um obviously mark had a he's i think suffers the worst for um withdrawal from the smoothers and um he seems to be showing more and more that he's um kind of like psychosis coming out yeah like there's there's a few times even where fred sort of has to verbally bitch slap him in the face to remind him you know to rein him in so there's a great kind of where they talk about the scene the moments of like when they're in the caves they're in the pitch dark they're trying to get themselves out they're trying to extract the hergok with olivia being with her legs mangled and they have intrepid eye and mark is just kind of sent ahead as a scout and like he just goes ahead like stealthy as fuck with like a knife and takes out like a shit ton of brutes like with just a knife and it was just how it describes the scene of just him stealthily wiping out this whole squad is is awesome it's really fucking cool i think it says like he was really brutal as well so that's why yeah he's he's like slipping up and he slices them in the back of the neck and severs their spinal cords because i think at one point the rest of the team come across a brute that's not quite dead yet yeah he's getting sloppy he's just been immobilized and he's just lying there yeah and uh, they, they just catch Mark in time for, I think, Mark just executes him. Yeah, the Stone Cold Killer. And I love that. I thought that was awesome. Parting shots. Savage book. Really loved it. Very, very good. Very well paced. There's lots going on. Tons of characters. So it has the whole Halo thing, Halo book thing of trying to keep track of everything, where it's going on. It does jump, but at least it stays on one planet this time. Yes, it's, and it's not, it's not like... Uh, new blood where it's jumping through time everything is just moving forward everything's constantly. chronological which is nice and the characters are quite strong the main characters are quite strong it this book did a great job for me hyping up for halo 5 because like i was like this is blue team set up now like okay it wasn't the blue team i wanted but it was awesome it was just like fred was such a strong character and i was like halo 5 yes i was told this book did a great job for me hyping me up for halo 5 also i got a free rec pack when i got the book so i was happy with that <laughs> yourself what did you think what's your major takeaways your favorite moments and whatnot yeah i have to agree with you um it's a very good book it's i'd say it's worthy of a top five and as halo novels Ooh, go i'd put it up there it's, Ooh, it's in yeah there. i I, th- I think it goes that far i quite like that whole <sighs> The part towards the end where they force Fred out of his armor, you know, there's there's one or two times during the this the whole thing where they Fred can't get into his Mjolnir, the you know, oh, the they have his armor taking it over. Yeah. yeah, it's locked down. You know, the 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 bit when he's in the hospital bed after he's been ridden down the hill like a sled, hmm. and the nurse is telling him to get back into bed, and he's basically standing there in a gown with his butt cheeks hanging out having an argument with her about how he wants some boots and he wants you know some gear and he wants to get out and then later on when he has to detonate his armor it i think fred's my favorite bit of this book yeah. i know it's a probably a bit of a cheat but it's no it's not it's totally worth it they, they build like they said they build a spartan and a personality unlike very many others you know I, yeah, I would say he's one of the best built. Just from this one book, one of the best built Spartans, like his personality. I say, like even even Naomi in the Kilo Five books, you don't get you get a good feel for who she is as a person, but not you know not Naomi's not quite broken, in the though. same way. Yeah. yeah, she's a very bro. Like Fred is a lot more together, and I imagine Linda and Kelly are probably fairly well o- settled, okay. Like, but Naomi was very much bro, and I think that was she was kind of. Ho- taken on to that team probably because of that so i think that that was probably it the 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 whole scene up on the during the surface war as well you know when they're trying to get out the pelicans and they're trying to get the warthogs to move and they're trying to you know the uh, the battalion try to enter orbit and the the local frigates attack them and take out the drop ships oh, i it, forgot about it's that. been it's been a long time since we've had a book that's really gone into big ground combat like not really since the day like i suppose even in the days of fall or reach and that that was naval combat yeah 
But I suppose uh, Contact Harvest. What was the last book that we really had? You know, prolonged sort of ground fighting. I feel like everything lately has been, you know, Space Halo combat. 5 was well, a small team skulking around. New Blood was a lot of on-ground combat. I know we jumped around yeah, a lot. But but New, that was... New Blood was kind of small teams doing small things. You know, the, this was war on a scale sort of worthy of the games. You know, big things are happening. They're happening all around. I'm sure Kilo 5 talks about the Arbiter's ground war. Mm, and that they kind, do. There's a lot of that kind of mention. Um, there is, isn't, don't, yeah, haven't they, they captured, oh, that, the, I can't remember his name, but the elite that Kilo 5 capture and hold, and hold hostage. Jill Madama? They don't capture Jill Madama. They want to capture him, but the, oh, that is what happens. Is that that's yeah. yes, he that's escapes. his origin story. Sorry, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Well, when it talks about his wife and his family, it cuts back to them a lot, and then you have their kind of battle and how is she gets rolled up in the the rebellion, essentially the civil war on Saint Helios. That's kind of like some of it. Oh, that, that kind of ground battle. I'm turned like, I mean, before that again, you've got the four on the trilogy, which is all over craziness. True. Okay, we went slightly longer. We're almost at an hour. Jesus, how did we do that? Uh, we just start talking and we don't stop. And there's only two of us here. I'm pretty. I'm pretty proud of that, to be honest. I didn't See? think the two of us would hold that together. We did yeah. pretty good. We did pretty We've good. done a reasonably good job. So, let's see. Final thoughts. It's a good book. If you haven't read, well, if you haven't read it and you're listening to this, shame on you. You should have read it first. Yeah. And but if you haven't, it's a book well worth getting. I would definitely look forward to anything else Troy Denning would do in the Halo universe. You know, if he. Yeah. I would. Well, I would hope he'd follow on from this. I want. To yeah, because um, would you would you rather he followed Veda or Fred? Oh, now you've done something to me. Or would it be a split book? Well, or would that start to get complicated? Originally, I would have went. Oh yeah, to be honest, if it's a split book, well, he was very focused here, so I'd like to believe he'd be focused again. If that that's that's how he would write, that he wouldn't hop all over the Halo universe. But God, well, I see before when I first read the book, I would have said, yeah, I want to see more of Veda. I want to see where those guys go, because I knew I had Halo Five coming to tell me Blue Team story. Now since there was fuck all Blue Team story in Halo Five, yes, I'm thinking, okay, I want to see what else he do. I want to see him bring in Linda, bring in Kelly, bring in Chief. I want to see what how he writes Chief. I would love to see that. I mean, seeing how he how he wrote Fred, I want to see what he what he but like, T Chief is obviously very protected property. So I don't know if we'd see Chief again in the book, what that would mm-hmm. be like, or who that would be given to, other than Eric. I don't know. I could see Karen Travis being allowed to write a write a blue team book because she does a really good job of, of building characters. Yeah, she yeah. had a great squad there. That's a good that's a good show actually, yeah. She she did a great job with the Kilo Five books and she does a fantastic job in the Gears of War books. When you think about what Gears of War are, you know, or what it is as a concept, it's meatheads fighting Bro-team. monsters that Bro-team. come out of the ground. Bro-team. Yeah, but, yeah. By the time she's done those four books, you know who Marcus Phoenix is as his character and you know the personal issues and struggles he has. You know, he's this sort of broken shell of a man with daddy issues. And Are they prequel books you know, to the first game? Some are prequels and some aren't. Some take place during the events. Um, there's Some of them bounce back and forth. I can't remember the titles off the top of my head. Oh, I have okay. joked I, about I, I we should do an April's it. Fool Day. And do Gears of War. Gears of War Book Club, um, but oh, wait, they, they start uh, in the first Gears. They mention the Pendulum Wars. Yeah, I remember that. Which is kind of the the last war humanity fought against themselves. So they start there in the days when his father served in the military, and they go forward. Okay, cool. But like she, she over the space of four books, she does a great job with that whole team. You know, she just she makes real people out of them. Like even someone like Bird, who's just you know the wise cracking asshole. They go into you know why he is the dick that he is. You know, cool. And the person he is he was he was the. Uh, it's not really a big spoiler to say he was the spoiled rich kid that. Well, not even the spoiled rich kid, but the rich kid that didn't want the rich kid life anymore. So he joined the army despite his family. Aha, that stereotype. But I, I would like, if anyone was to do a blue team book, I would like it to be Karen Travis. Yeah, I'd be okay with then that. And again, there there might be someone else out there that were, you know, 343 have done a great job so far of just, like, getting good authors that work with the series, you know, like Greg Byrne, different people like that. Mm. They find people that play to whatever the particular strength of a book is and work with them. Which yeah. I'm curious to see what comes next because we haven't had any books mentioned for this year. We haven't had anything announced yet at all, actually, have we? No, it's it's been quiet, but then again, it was a few months into the year last year before they mentioned the big drop. Yeah, and we did get five last year. 
So let's yeah, I'm kind of hoping they keep that pace up this year, you know. Go small and big, small and big. Yeah, me too. We we don't have a comic series going at the moment. I was just There's about no to say that. The comics the have truth. finished up. We have nothing announced, really. There's stuff i'm sure coming that jeff's hinted at it in a couple of the cannon fathers he had, yeah, it's, it's, they're, his they're, team he, he's gone quiet now on purpose because yeah. they're building things the lower teams are working away which i have stuff that we talk about in the next podcast i'm not sure if this will go up before the weekend show or not well we can hold on to this until we need it really there's a microsoft event taking place next week so i want to do a oh, big yeah? speculation uh, the 20th of february microsoft are having some sort of a big press event. Oh, I didn't know that. Is so, it related? I, do you think it's related to gaming, or is it like? like no, it's it's Xbox related. I think oh, Phil Spencer came out and said it's they're they're holding an event, and they're doing a thing, and no one really knows what it is. So, oh, I think exciting. on the next episode, I want to do a sort of big speculation to see do we think you know maybe Halo Wars Two might be revealed. Yeah. I know it's kind of early and before E three, but. I think they're coming around to that way of thinking, you know, we show our stuff early and then we just go over the nuts and bolts later. Yeah, well, they could maybe announce it now and start building hype between now and E3 and then well, actually now, have yeah, stuff to show at E3 as opposed to just announcing Between the end E3. of this month and if we guess Halo Wars comes out in September, like that's a nice little window to slowly start. You know, if they do something similar to the way they did with the build-up for Halo 5, you know, I can see that coming along nicely. Yeah, I actually I'm kind of intrigued to see how they do a Halo Wars because the Halo Wars fan base, or you'd imagine, is quite small. Like it has a very it good the, name. I think the old game sold about it. the original sold something like two and a half million copies. I think that's quite good. It's that is. I think it's on a par with the uh, C anniversary. It sold something like that. I would have said more from anniversary to be honest. But anyway, that that but I fucking love that game. They're the they're twice. in and around that. You know, like the two. I think the two lowest selling Halo properties is Halo Wars and Anniversary. Halo Wars did seem to get a great reception when it was announced. It got I mean people got hyped. It got people talking. Even if other people are like, oh whatever, it's only like what the hell is Halo Wars? But I think it'll be quite. I'm just intrigued to see how they build build towards it in terms of getting people who aren't normally into this into it but uh, this is stuff we're going to save for the show at the weekend i think right so i think that'll uh that'll about do us for this week lovely job said we we got there eventually next week will be the regular book club for february maybe no 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 we're going to do it everyone will read six issues of a comic we can get that done okay i have strategically paced everything for this year to see that we can get it done but you have you taken into account the fact that Drew does not read words good? Yes, I okay. I got him audiobook versions of the Forerunner <laughs> trilogy. Brilliant. We are going to get him through this. He will get there. We love you, Drew. Yeah, we do. Get a TV, you bum. Oh, right, guys. Well, that'll do us uh, for this week. You know all the usual. Go to Rated M. Follow us on the... Go to the website. Find us on Twitter. Facebook. Join the Facebook group. Lots of lovely people in there. Add us on... Xbox Live. Yes, add us there. Follow us. Um, we do play games sometimes. I've fallen off the wagon again this week, but oh man, I'm off the wagon hardcore. But I need to get back. I will get back. We're still talking about doing our four-player co-op stuff, and I think we've just started streaming the game nights. Oh, the Chris, did that happen? Sorry, I mean the first game nights tonight. Uh, I saw some mention of stuff was being put up online, and recordings of some of their games were going up. So some people are recording bits and pieces. That's pretty good. Cool. And Krista has now worked out that she has super duper spectacular internet. Oh yeah. Well done Krista. So she's going to try and stream some stuff as well. But well that'll do us anyway and we'll go and we'll leave you to it and we'll see you on the next episode. Evolved. Evolved. That was really good.